Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, so this is what I've been thinking about doing um, this week. A little sort of uh, virtual machine, little virtual computer platform. I thought it would be fun to have something that is sort of um, uh, both a you know learning project to to build one of these things and also something that can be sort of a, a substrate or um, uh, sort of a little foundation or something like that for other hobby programming languages. Uh, I've put together a couple of couple of um, compilers and languages and stuff like that in the past and. And I think you always come to this point where um, you either need to go reach for LLVM, which is, you know, obviously a huge chunk of, chunk of code to include and complex dependencies and stuff you're including to generate code for any type of machine, right? Or you can go with something and say like, well, I'm only going to generate code for this specific thing. And there are other options like Banarian and stuff like that for Wasm. Um, uh, and a few times I've attempted to to write my own, uh, you know, uh, IR, and also a few times my own um, uh, machine code generator. And that stuff obviously is just like very complicated, really, really time consuming task. And sometimes that's fun, you know. Sometimes that's for for learning how that stuff works. But you know, other times they just want something um, something that's running. Um, so that's one of the goals. So it can be kind of nice if um, if this little thing could um, could be an escape hatch for, for the time. So when I create a little hobby programming language, and you just kind of want to run it on some machine. Um, so generating code for this should be pretty straightforward. Um, and from the first goal, like just having fun and learning, I think simplicity is, um, is pretty important because, you know, it's a limited amount of time I'm going to spend on this. Um, um, and third, I think... Uh, that computers are just sort of moving very quickly. There's there's some weird connection to sort of consumerism in um, the way we write software, right? There's this sort of, you know, write it, ship it, run it, and then we just move on to the next thing. And the thing that we just shipped, it's, it's dead, right? Even the web is something where you constantly have to maintain your program for it to keep or your web page or whatever for it to keep like working right if you just build something you put it on a web page and you wait a few years it'll just be broken right unless you use a very small subset of the web platform um and you know that's kind of natural right uh i think that comes from um the um some of the origins of uh of of web um and some of the, uh, you know, that there's no versioning, right? There's there's no different versions of the API and stuff like that. Um, and also the fact that it serves a, a huge economy of just like uh, software and stuff like that, right? And, and then, of course, we have specific kind of operating systems or platforms like, you know, Mac OS, Mac OS 10, Mac OS 11, Mac OS 12, Windows 10, Windows 95, Windows 11. Uh, you know, a variety of Linuxes and BSDs, um, and uh, yeah, obviously you can you can write a program. I think Linux is probably the thing that gets the closest uh, to me of all all the options right now. If you if you only consider the Linux kernel, uh, which obviously gives you a very limited sort of way to express yourself, but if you only go the Linux kernel. Um, you have sort of the syscalls, which is kind of like a virtual machine in a way, if you, you know, if you bend it a little bit in your mind. Um, and that's pretty much stable. You can write a thing, you can run a thing that was written in the 90s, essentially on a, on like a kernel uh, from yesterday. Um, but obviously, as soon as you, you include third party libraries, like those things are going to change and, you know, you're going to be, going to be back in this kind of thing. Anyhow, I digress. Uh, long. <laughs> a long, long side conversation. Interesting about that. Anyhow, I think the third, the third point would be, um, and maybe I should take these out. So, so a couple of little goals. So first off, learn. Oops. Uh, learn. Have fun. Right. 
Uh, so, simplicity. The second point I was talking about um, is some sort of uh, substrate. I can't if I can spell. Oh, there we go. Some sort of substrate um, uh, thing to make other things on. Okay. And the third point, which is kind of Talked about a lot is um, uh, I wouldn't say perma computing, but sort of uh, longevity of programs, maybe longevity. Um, sort of, you know, I want to be able to run a program, a multimedia. Or is it just multimedia? Is that how it's called? Program in 10 plus years. Right. Um, and that was interesting. Like looking at um, things like uh, Nintendo, right? NES and SNES, um, Game Boy. There's like a whole bunch of these, like, you know, C80 things. Um, C64, there's a, a bunch of these systems from the past that were really simple that people are still building programs for today in emulators. And um, that's probably the closest we've gotten, I think, to something that's um, somewhat of a, of a longer life, right? I don't think anything is permanent. Everything is transient, you know, if you want to be philosophical about it. But so I wouldn't go as far as calling something permanence or permanence. Uh, anyhow, um, that's Stadium. And here we have a couple of other notes. I shared these on the, on the Twitter the other day. Um, I think I did at least. Well, I think that this thing, whatever it is, she just embraced the linear memory model. You know, this idea that um, that C embraces uh, uh, WebAssembly, for example, many things, right? This idea that there is, sure, there might be on actual hardware, you know, multiples of segment and memory models and stuff, but let's just say that it, memory starts at zero and it ends at some sort of like large number, right? Uh, and the way you address things is by, you know, giving it an offset, right, from the zero. Um, pretty straightforward, uh, proven, uh, simple, really flexible um, uh, model. So let's go with that. Rather than anything high level, that's like, oh, memory is just the concept, man. Now, uh, let's just, you know, put like an address in a register or whatever we'll end up using um, and just treat that as a number, treat that as an address. You just do um, pointer arithmetic and stuff like that. Um, that stuff, I think, uh, so sometimes people are like shying away from that and see or saying that's the root of a lot of a lot of bugs. And yeah, sure, that might be true, but I think that that is also the root of a lot of uh, the awesomeness of something like C. Okay. Uh, simple semantics. Um, there should probably just be. Actually, I've, I've, I think I've changed my mind about this a little bit. Uh, that there should probably just be like. Glo sorry, global constants as a concept. Like there's just constant data you can bake into uh, a ROM or executable, whatever you call that, like a little program. Um, and then you can reference those constants, right? So if you want to have like the, you know, constants for pi or something like that, you can just bake that into a program and then you reference that in all the different functions. Uh, there's some constant mutable locals. Um, and that includes parameters and variables. I think those are all treated the same. Um, so inputs to functions, outputs from functions, and temporary sort of like variable data inside a function are all the same thing. Um, and then there are conventions around like, you know, in in how do you how do you uh, uh, provide the parameters before a function call? How do you read the results after a function call? Um, they, I think that the virtual machine should use registers because I think that's just like a really neat, um, yes model. I just kind of like that. Um, 
Stack models are cool too, but I think it would be more of a fun challenge to go with registers. Um, but no, the there might be a little like I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a minute here, but there there might be a little sort of like layer on top of very very lightweight tiny sort of assembler slash compiler that might allow you to say hey you know just call this thing X and go pick a register for it later automatically for me. I don't want to pick registers. I think that would be neat. That would just make uh, a bunch of stuff like easier to, to do. Essentially, when you don't care about a register for temporaries, which I think is the is the majority of cases, you can just give them um, uh, usable names. Um, and finally, some sort of simple syntax, and this is about uh, the little input language, um, which I won't start with writing this. This will probably come a little later, but some sort of simple syntax that is really to parse and read. Um, and so here's like, uh, here's some sort of little idea. Um, now I'm, obviously I'm playing with the syntax and this doesn't, you know, mean much, but semantically, like there's this idea that you have a, a, a local, right? So one of these things, like a register essentially, but you can name it. So you say one, and then you say one is like number one, uh, which would be a constant, a global constant that you reference here. So this will just simplify that for you. Um, and then you say two, and it's like load the other global constant, which would be number two. And then you say something like, uh, you know, in this third register, put the result of adding this register and that register together, right? And then put the, uh, the result of that um, into, oh, this is weird, she has to, and return the result of that in, res in result value one, something like that. Um, so that, that's, that, that's the, that's the general idea. Um, let's see. Then I shared this on Twitter, I think two days ago. So the next thing I started playing with, like, you know, what is the, what is the, um, the level at which you are um, deciding on where things going, where you're putting these little programs together as text, as source code, not the, the VM instruction set. I'll get to that a little later, but, um, and I think that there are three options. There is a register style, right? Where you're explicitly naming your registers, you're exp explicitly um, uh, storing loading uh, into memory and from memory. Um, there is an SSA style. This is usually what you find in like most compilers and uh, immediate representations. Like if you've ever looked at LLVMs, IR, for example, it will look roughly like this. Um, SSA, I guess, like you know, sorry, let me just mention the last one. The last one is like local style, um, and this is what you'll find in things like I think this is more common with stack machines. You find this with both WebAssembly and Lua. Uses this kind of abstraction. I guess Lua got kind of registers today. They call them that, but yeah. Anyhow, I think the what what SSA brings um, a constant and prose compared to register style is um, that uh, you have this kind of like named values, right? Rather than you have explicitly um, defined registers. You then don't have to deal with like files, which are essentially like a kind of a, a fan in thing. If if you're familiar with this, you know what this is. But if you're not, phi is essentially um um it's like it's, let's see what's a good metaphor for this. Okay, let's say that let's say that the three doors in front of you, right? And a your friend now goes away somewhere around the house and then comes back to you up through door number one, right? Uh, and then the friend goes around again, goes through the house and come out through door number three, right? And maybe the friend is bringing different, like, I don't know, treats or something, like a cupcake when they come out of, <laughs> you know, door number one, and maybe like they've eaten the cupcake when they come out through door number three. Um, and so it, for you to be able to like know what, um, shit, I don't know how to phrase this. Anyhow, so Phi is essentially saying that, you know, this person can come out of these three different doors, right? And whatever the number of cupcakes is going to be 
wh whichever door they came out of, right? So in this little case, um, uh, you have result one here. So when you get to this block, so you go, you know, it goes one, two, three, four, like this. So we start here and this just says, you just jump to block one, right? So it just continues. Um, this will be, this this thing will be important later. Actually, This is dumb. I think you can skip this. Anyhow. Um, and the first thing it does is says phi, like if it comes from door, you know, block number zero, then the value is one. But if it comes from door number three, right? <laughs> uh, block two, which is comes down here, then uh, the the value of rest one is the value of rest two. And you can have more things if you have, you know, more um, uh, predecessors. Um, and the same thing is here. Anyhow, it gets a little complicated. Just explaining it is a little complicated. Once you once you grok phi, it's not it's not that hard of a concept, but it definitely does complicate things a little bit logically. You, for example, you have to sort of like as you're writing this, you sort of have to have the uh, the <laughs> the premonition or the foresight to to see that you're going to write this block down here, and that's going to become a predecessor of annotated predecessors here on the side. Um, Anyhow, I rolled this up pretty quickly. I think this this is something that is really useful, especially for optimizations. SSA is useful, um, sort of as an intermediate, but not as something that you write. I think either like kind of traditional assembly with uh, when you name the specific registers or the local style. I think the local style is the best one. So uh, actually, I I think it we ended up with a combination of both of these. So for the virtual machine, it explicitly names registers. There's no concept of locals in the uh, in the virtual machine. Um, but as you're writing these little assembly, these little programs that that little thing will put together into virtual machine programs, um, you do deal with locals, and then the registers are allocated for you automatically when this text is parsed and compiled into VM bytecodes, opcodes. Okay, so that's the deal. You um, you write this, and this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. Okay, I did some explanations here, but I'm not going to talk about these. I think these are some some things that also made me excited about just the, the the concept of things like to be able to write programs at this level that can draw to the screen, they can play sound and stuff like that without having to involve any. Um, any particular operating system concepts. Again, to satisfy um, uh, longevity and substrate points for the, for the goals. Okay, okay. so um, yesterday I was sketching out a little bit um, of what the, uh, what the instruction, I got a weird code. What the uh, inst instruction um, uh, encoding might look like. Um, I think Lua is, has a pretty like elegant yet maybe slightly over engineered. I don't know. No, actually, I, I would say it's pretty elegant. It's pretty nice. Um, uh, in instruction encoding. Um, and what I ended up with is something very similar to Lua, which is where, where do I have it? Um, so as you might have noticed, I've put together a really simple um, program here. Let's see, put my coffee cup away. Um, if you look at the, the code, it's it's pretty little, just some stuff I put together to get started. Um, and let's see, build, ugh, debug. I forgot about this. Uh, run. Where is gonna end up? Um, all right, so, okay. I just have this little build script that it just generates. Maybe I should tell you. So there's the magic. Um, it just generates like an uh, a Ninja build file, and then it just like runs Ninja essentially. Um, so to give the super minimal, the only dependency here is bash and. Ninja and obviously a compiler. I'm using Clay. Um, okay, so build it, run it. This program right now doesn't do much. Maybe I'll get to this in a few minutes. 
Um, but let's just look at this first. Okay, okay let me just clear this. Uh, okay, so uh, instruction encoding. Um, I also looked at risk five. Risk five is obviously pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's a, a bunch of other architectures that are that are interesting and 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 neat and stuff like that. It elegant in various ways. Um, I think what I've what I've done here is um, is ended up in a place where I was like, oh, can I pack these bits together? Really, like I probably only need seven bits for like the 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 operation code, right? And maybe I it, I can even get away with six bits. Like sixty four operations seems fine and stuff like that. And I tried to be really clever about it. And I was like, you know what? That's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's just keep it simple. The um, each instruction is a fixed size, and that's kind of that allows some cool things. Like the PC can be uh, instructions, and jump offsets and branch offsets and stuff are instruction counts. And that means that you can just make it so that memory addresses is always, always like data memory. There's no execution, executable memory that you deal with. You only deal with like instructions um, and inst instruction distances, right? And that may, might make uh, code more portable. Um, so they're 32 bit long. Uh, they're a little endian. Um, the uh this i just kind of mentioned this line here that you know they're expression instructions throughout their bytes um and then i give the um the uh what is this is this most significant i always forget about this i have to like go look this up now um i feel like them okay whatever this is least they're most I think it's most significant, right? Anyhow, they, uh, I believe this is the most significant bits. These these bad boys, these first eight bits, um, I give those to uh, an opcode. Uh, so risk five and Lua, Lua, for example, has like a smaller opcode field. It's got seven, it used to have six, it's got seven bits now. And then it's got one bit, like the squishes in here that they called K. Um, which is sort of like a flag that like changes like, slightly the, the meaning of the arguments for the operator or the operation. And then I think, I don't know if, if I'm right here, but I think that's sort of like a, a bit of an afterthought realizing that like, well, we should have like a move operation for like register, register and a separate move operation for um, uh, a constant to register. But instead, this K flag indicates if, like, you know, the 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 B the B immediate names a constant, names a register, and it gets a little complicated. And similarly, like Risk Five has what they call funk funk, like three and seven. I don't know why they're called three and seven, but they have these two one or two different fields in the instruction that that uh, comes with the operation. So, like, I think now I might be wrong. I have the I have the Risk Five. Hope you can see this. Let me bring this into the viewport. Um, yeah, let's see. All right. Where is it? Base instruction format. It's here somewhere. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Um, so this is kind of what Risk Five does, which uh, makes it a little tricky. Like, there's the opcode six bits. Uh, so 64 of those, right? Um, um, Insane. Um, and then you got this thing here, func three, func seven. So that this this thing actually like together with this describes the actual operation to perform. All right. So there's there's some examples. Maybe integer. I'm just getting up to. Okay. Yeah. So for instance, here are some. This will do. Right. So here's like an opcode called operation immediate maybe I don't know and then in func3 you have this like secondary opcode that's like add an integer or you know there's other operations right so essentially like what 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 they could have done here and I'm sure they have really good reasons and risk five is like you know a, a real industry strength architecture but I think semantically at least you could say that this is really just like an opcode that's called add i immediate right if you smash those together so uh, 
so I was thinking, you know, this is just a hobby project. I'm not going to make it very complicated. I'm not going to try to make it like the most performant thing or anything like that. So let's just have for anything like that, like where you have a move from, you know, constant to register, register, register. Let's just make those different opcodes and make the opcode field um, <clears throat> large enough to fit a bunch of operations. So 256, probably more than what I ever need for something like this. The remainder of the instruction encoding is just uh, a bunch of fields. So like for things that need four arguments, there is uh, five bits for uh, slot A, five for B, C, and then the remaining bits nine is for a uh, uh, fourth slot. And uh, and then it's like you, you only need three argu arguments, then um, the, the, the third argument then is like a wide one, and I just choose W here, inspired by Lua's like naming scheme. I think they call it K or D. I don't know. They call it some letter. I didn't know what it was. I was like, well, it's wide, so let's use W. So that's what this little nomenclature in here means. That the that the third argument here now is like sort of a wide one. Um, so for stuff like immediate values, you now have like 14 bits instead of five bits, right, to express something. Um, uh, so if you have something like a conditional branch, then um, two to four, 14 is, is going to give you like 16,000 um, uh, possible like uh, uh, opcode, sorry, instructions that you can skip forward to, right? Or I guess um, 8,000, 8,000, that's more reasonable because it would be a signed number. Um, so it would give you 8,000 um, uh instructions that you can jump forward to or backward from. This is just an example of like a, uh, an immediate, like a, a branch instruction with an immediate value of like how many do you want to. For, for one that uses like a register as the indirection, you can just use this. So, so the registers, there are 32 registers for each type for integers and floats. Uh, five bits is enough to express 32. Um, and yeah, so you can see this picture, what happens if you only need, you know, if you only need one single argument, you have 24 bits and now suddenly you can express really large numbers. Um, Okie dokes. So then what I've done here in this project is I've set up a couple of, just a couple of macros just to like make this encoding stuff um, less of a headache. This I took from, um, let's see, this other thing, I'm just gonna lift this over to show. This is from a different project. I put together this hobby VM many years ago called Sol, which in turn was inspired by Lua. Um, so I have retrofitted these uh, these macros into this new project. Um, so you can see I've just put here like sort of like the size of the operation, eight bytes, bits, sorry, uh, of the arguments, A, B, C, and D, and then sort of like what is the size of, you know, when, when the D argument is not used, what is the size of C and B and A and so forth. And then the position of them, which is just, you know, it's going from from this direction into this direction. This, you have the most significant count. Sorry, I have to look this up. I'm going crazy. I'll figure this out later. Um, it really doesn't matter. I just want to call it a thing, you know, over here. Uh, 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 okay, so this is kind of just what I put together this morning. Um, I've got just some code I retrofitted from a previous project. This is just a super simple memory allocator. It is grabs, um, it is does memmap, just grab a chunk of bytes, and then it just, you know, hands them out essentially. And then a super simple just array implementation. Um, and then this file just has, uh, I've just generated a list of, uh, names of the operations and the types that the header file has defined just to make things easier to print. Um, and the header file here, I just made a list of the types. I think the, there are really only a few types. Um, so the, the register size is 64 bits. At least I think that's what I'll stick with. And that means that there are uh, five sizes of, of integers. Um, one bit, you know, for bool essentially. Uh, and then there are two size floating point. And then this, I think I might just get rid of this. This doesn't really, I don't know. I just toss it in there. So play around, but a pointer type, but I don't think there will be point like 
pointers as in um, um, like executable memory pointer distances or anything. I think that will not be needed. Let's use an i64. And, uh, and then just like a few operations. I just wanted to plug a couple of these in just to, uh, just to figure out if this was like sensible. Um, and then I have a, just a couple of type taps, uh, like the, uh, the type code. It's just this thing, right? Is like eight uh, byte. Um, and then just like generate an enum for that. And similarly, the opcode is like a byte. Fits in here. And generate an enum for those. Um, and then just say that an instruction is uh, u32, right? unsigned 32 bit integer. And then here is just a little structure for the uh, memory allocator that I show you, a little structure for an array. The two function definitions for getting the name of uh, an, an operation for, again, for like printing and debugging and stuff like that. And then a few routines here just for the, just for the memory manager. Don't have to like look at those. It's just run off the mill stuff. Um, a function for growing an array. Um, and then this thing, I toss this in, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna need it because I, I need this in pretty much every project. Uh, um, let's see, R, oh. oh, I didn't name this. Uh, so this thing is essentially as like a um, append buffer, just for, you know, doing things like string formatting. Basically always need something like that in projects. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, so there really is no code yet. There's just a couple of some definitions of, um, of types and operations, and surely I will be chained in this, and definitely, definitely be changing this list of operations here. And then the uh, the program itself, right? We I show you these kind of macros. That it's kind of it looks kind of nasty, but it's it's just sort of um, shifts and and ors and ands. Um, okay, and finally here, I'm trying to just put together this factorial example program that I showed you from in the, where is it, idea file. Okay, so, so earlier I was talking about, I was thinking about should this, should the style of the VM and or the style of the, um, uh, the assembly format that you write as a person uh, deal directly with the registers, should it deal with SSA named values or um, sort of locals, you know, variables. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I grabbed this um, and I just pasted it in here in a comment. And then I recreated it here with the, uh, with the operations, right? So uh, r up underscore move is just this thing here, right? And that's just generate. It's just generated with a pre preprocessor macro here to become, you know, our up name. Um, and then we have the arguments. So this little this little macro here. Maybe I should grab this down here so we can look at this table. Um, so I'll slot it in here. I made my screen a little smaller so it fits on a video thing. Um, maybe I can put it out. Okay. Um, squish this in. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the first thing, excuse me, it's a little coffee. Um, uh, the first thing that happens is that we're copying, um, Registered zero, which is the first argument, which is the number we want the to factorize. So we copy this into register eight. So this is just a temporary. You can see this light up here in my editor. This is temporary. Uh, and we make this copy. This is just implementation of factorial. It's nothing to do with the VM, but we just do this to simplify the return value since in my this hobby ISA here and my hobby calling convention um uh you isn't this my idea program thing here mm. okay 
Let's see. Oh yeah, separate file. Um, yeah, so there's a little calling convention here that the first eight uh, in integer registers are both inputs and outputs um, to a function, uh, same for a floating point. Right, so you're back here. That means that the this function has one input parameter and one output result, right? And that means that this guy is in R0. And this guy is also in R0, so I read this is zero. And factorial, and at least this tail recursive version of factorial just accumulates like a result. Um, so we're using uh, R8 as the accumulator, and we just initialize that to N. And then we're going to use this uh, other register to just get a return value. And that, that way, we don't have to do, do an extra copy and stuff at the end. Um, you, can, you can write this probably in many ways. Uh, also, I have not run this. I don't know if this works. I've just like looked at this and thought about it. So I might have made a mistake here. But I think, I think this function would work if it was compiled. Um, and so that just corresponds to the same thing, eight here, register eight, that's just this number down here, right? So move, or it's, maybe I should name this copy instead. This annoys me sometimes because it's not really move like what the, what the move instruction does in most ISAs is, is copy, right? You you copy the value in register zero to register eight. Like after this operation, it's not like register zero, it's like invalid. Now register eight and register zero has the same value, so it's more of a copy. But anyhow, so this copies zero to eight. And an IP here, I don't know if you saw it earlier, this is just like a, I just allocate a bunch of, uh, a bunch of memory here for like 32 instructions, um, which is probably more than enough. It is certainly for this program. Um, and so what I do, this is just an array of 32 instructions, right? And then I have a little um, program counter, right? It starts zero, zero right here. Starts right here at zero. And then as I add um, uh, as I add instructions to this array IP, I just increment the, the uh, logical program counter. Okay. So the next thing is just uh, loading an immediate, right? So this loads the immediate value one into register zero. Okay. So into register zero, load one. I've added it here in the side. The next thing that happens is a conditional branch. Um, so we want to check in the factorial function. We want to check if the if the uh, if the argument is um, uh, zero, because if it is, the, we're we're done and there's nothing to factorize. So we check here if equals right. So if the value in our in a register eight is equal to zero then branch to um, end, right? So if n is zero, go to end. And end is down here. So then it just skips all of these things, three instructions, and just it will issue the return um, uh, instruction, which ends the function. Um, and the return value will be one, since we changed that here, right? So you give it um, zero. Am I wrong about this? I should go look up the factorial function there, but I'm pretty sure. Um, okay, so branch, I'm just playing with language. If it's if equals or the more traditional BR for branch, I don't know. Uh, so branch if equals immediate. Uh, so branch uh, looking at register eight, if it's zero, then branch by jumping three instructions forward. So it's a, it's a relative uh, uh, branch, right? Uh, and three instructions, these are the three that will be skipped, the next three, right? And the, and the final one is ret. So if, if, uh, if the value in register eight here is zero, then it's going to increment the, uh, the program counter by like three. So we'll do PC, um, Three here, right? Which one is one is evaluating this, uh, which means that it would skip these and then it would resume up uh, with return, right? How most CPUs do it? Um, there's there's also like a probably an absolute um, absolute branch instruction that this thing should have that says you know go to 
and a, and a specific number of like go to instruction offset um, 1828, you know, from the very first instruction of your whole program. So you can do absolute jumps and stuff like that. But um, what I want to do here is just start really small and just see if I can get this uh, really simple um, uh, function just working. Uh, and I'll work my way out of from there, right? So there's there will be no parser or anything like that for this until this thing works. The next step after getting this together, sorry for scrolling. The next step after um, getting this thing together, I think will just be a little um, a little function that that I can give this array of instructions to that will then just print out the um, <clears throat> do the opposite essentially of this disassemble it or whatever you want to call it print out exactly what they are. I just like to, if I hit save here, you'll see on the right side that, you know, save a couple of times. Um, this is just the way I like to work. I like to um, kind of explore programming and have it sort of like live updating more or less as I'm writing programs. And so right now you see, this is the end of it. It just, I just print out the size of the instructions, right? Which is um, 28 bytes it says up here. The other stuff is just some printout to tell me what's going on. So it's, you know, when I hit save here, it um, it runs that build script I showed you earlier, which just um, uh, runs Ninja, the kind of like a make system, really simple. Uh, and that just like recompiles any files that have changed and dependencies, links the program. And then the build script just runs the program for me here. Um, so this is just the pit of the program running. So it runs the program. And bytes is a print statement. Where did I print that? Oh, in that was like when I was testing out the memory thing earlier. So remove that. Let's go back. Keep it simple. Uh, so it just runs this program right, and here is um, is that uh, log message. Okay, so that's it. This is going on here. So for that reason, the next step I want to do uh, that'll be in uh, another video. But the next step I want to do is um, um, to to format this so I can get feedback about like how much did I screw up because you know I always screw up I always make some mistakes um, and so I want that feedback of like what does the program look like versus what is the encoding I believe I made for the program so that's kind of the next step and after that um, after that sort of format formatter or debugger or whatever or not debugger formatter let's call it formatter. Uh, will be uh, an evaluator, like the, the sort of the heart of the virtual machine, the thing that that uh, that runs this little program and spits out the result of, you know, the 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 computation of this function, right? Where we can give it an input value, an input argument, and then we just print out the uh, the result from it, um, and we can and and from there, of there is is it's a little fussy to tell, but at some point off there will be some uh, some parser for writing this sort of uh, little simple assembly language to to uh, avoid having to do this kind of compile time program building. Um, yeah, so so that's that's it. That's the summary. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff, just reach out on the Twitter. Um, I've tried to do these like live streams on Twitch before and it's been just like a very like unpleasant experience, not from a human, oh well, not from an audience perspective, but from like a technology perspective, it's just like super janky stuff and it's, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I'll try to do these kind of, um, offline videos and, uh, yeah, you can also reach out on Twitter until next time.